All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I know that folks are still coming in, but we are going to begin with this latest webinar brought to you by Talent Board and one of our generous supporters, SHL, a fabulous organization. We're going to have a great webinar today talking about differentiating your candidate experience with science. Two things that are very close to my heart. My name is Kevin Grossman, president of Talent Board, and we welcome you all today and joining us for this webinar. And we're gonna be focused on embracing data throughout the recruitment process to understand candidate behavior, deliver outcomes and adapt to change, which is very important, especially in this year, like a year like none other, for sure. So um, a couple of housekeeping, housekeeping items that I'll introduce our, our presenters. We're going to do Q&A like you usually do at the end of a webinar and feel free to queue up your questions though if you do have them, especially if you hear something that one of the presenters says that you're like, wow, I want to, I want to ask more about that. Then you can either post that in the Q&A part of the Zoom uh, dashboard or the chat function as well and feel free to do either our, our team is on and monitoring the questions and we'll make sure to get to them when we get to the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Lance Andrews, Director of Solution Design North America at SHL, and also Alex Sparrow, Assessment Specialist, City and County of Denver. Welcome presenters. Thank you, Kevin, great to be here. And thanks for the talent board for hosting us once again. Absolutely, it's, it's all yours. Thank you. All right. So I'll introduce myself and then Alex as well. So let you introduce, introduce yourself. Uh, as Kevin said, my name is Lance. So I work at SHL. We're a talent assessment and talent analytics, people intelligence organization. My background is in consulting and with uh, uh, education and IO psychology. So I represent kind of the consulting wing of what we can do to apply scientific solutions for our customers. And I'm really excited to have uh, Alex Sparrow from the city and county of Denver, who has some really great examples that she'll be sharing you know, some very practical things that they're doing at the city and county of Denver. So Alex, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself. Thanks Lance. So I'm Alex Sparrow. I am an assessment specialist. I run our assessment program for the city and county of Denver. Uh, but today I'm actually gonna be representing uh, most of our talent acquisition team talking about the broader context, not just assessment. Yeah, so th thanks for that, Alex. And just to give everyone an overview of what we will cover, I'll start with a little bit of a, some foundational information on candidate experience and some things that, that we're seeing with, with research and trends over the years that have obviously adapted now to be the hundredth person of the day to talk about changing times. Uh, won't belabor that, but you know, what are we seeing with candidate experience and what are the drivers of candidate experience? And then get into some, exa some, some examples for how to leverage different techniques to increase the candidate's experience throughout the entire candidate funnel, the, the recruitment funnel and, and selection process. So from sourcing and attracting through keeping the candidates engaged in the process and, and, and adding value to the candidates throughout. And then let's not forget about the end of the funnel, which is obviously, you know, think of, of an onboarding team, but that's very much the recruitment process and how do you maintain that momentum and accelerate that through the transition to a new employee. So really cool things that, that the city and county of Denver have been doing and are continuing to doing to do and adapting to the, to the current day and, you know, the every, week or month has presented new challenges. So we've got some uh, very contemporary examples of things that, that they're doing there to, to uh, keep, keep the candidate experience uh, very much in the, in the category of, of, of cutting edge and, and thrilling. So um, as I said, let's start with a little bit of a, of a frame for the, for the discussion and some, some background. Um, to, it, it, the candidates today have different expectations than they have from, from years past and that's stating the obvious but if, if I think if this is some I think this comes from Gartner just looking at the the categorization of the way candidates typically had applied in in, in days gone by the analog era as they've as they've called it the the committed candidate where it's a very linear process and a lot of talent acquisition processes were built with this in mind so candidates research the organizations that they want to work for they find that they shortlist the jobs at those organizations that they want to apply to they apply to those jobs. And then after they've been screened and, and evaluated, they, the next step would be to speak with a recruiter. And that was the, the linear expectation that most organizations had that candidates would have done in finding them to get to the point of application. But with all of the, the dig, digital technologies, the casual candidate is on the rise. And as you, you know, we all know on this call that you can apply with, with great ease. You know, the click of a button from Indeed or, or LinkedIn and you're, you're, you're in the pool. 
And so that research hasn't happened and they haven't gone out and found out where they want to work or why they would even want to work at an organization and then go through that shortlisting process. That's happening after they've talked with the recruiter. And one of my colleagues, the, the, I don't want to steal his joke, but the, what he always says, you know, the, what he's heard from, from uh, talent acquisition teams is sometimes the recruiter's first question they get from a candidate is, who was who this again? What, what job was this? And, you know, not having, uh, not knowing exactly where they had applied. So that's the kind of the, the, the backdrop. And if we look at what actually drives a positive candidate experience, there's a lot of things to it, and I'll, I'll get into a few more things in, in a moment, but I think if I were to categorize the, the top level things that I, I've seen be most important overall is first and foremost, transparency. I think candidates are, are, are done with this black box, no control scenario where organizations are going to take all the power and, and, you know, don't call us, we'll call you and not give you any information. That, that the, the, the black hole where you've just, you know, everything's sucked in, you don't hear back from a while, you may never hear from an organization unless the rejection really is, or it, it, you can't do that anymore. So having a, a transparent process um, where they know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and what's going what's to be collected is, is really important, which is related to the fairness piece of it, right? So candidates that feel that the process is fair and giving them the chance to put their best foot forward have a two times better reaction to the, to the process when, when they feel that they can tell and they can sense that 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 equity part and that fairness part is really for, uh, really really brought into the, to the recruitment experience. And more and more, candidate feedback, it used to be something that most organizations, just for avoidance of something that could be uncomfortable down the, down the road with a candidate and telling them you know, why they didn't get the job, if, uh, long avoided feedback, but uh, providing candidates feedback and letting them know, you know what, what you were looking for and, and maybe some reasons why they weren't accepted can decrease the resentment dramatically in the candidate experience. So to just to summarize, if we were to kind of put a, a pin on it here, what candidates expect is a, is a simple and a transparent process. Um, they want to have the, the hiring process acknowledged, uh, explain what, what's going to happen, when, when it's going to happen, and be able to prepare them through for the interview experience and for what comes next. Not this guessing game of what may happen and, and when it may happen, Candidates want to know, and if you think of all the technologies that, that people engage with, you have greater opportunities than ever to have some transparency. If you apply for a loan, you know what's going to happen and when. You can get text updates when, when those are going to when those next steps happen. Candidates want the same thing; they want a consumer grade experience with that process. And then, you know, to, to differentiate, having that the ability to provide that that meaningful feedback to a candidate and energizing them and providing value. Is, is what's gonna differentiate the process. So before we get, I promise I wanna have Alex take more of the, the, the starring role in sharing some of the examples, but just setting the stage a little bit more in terms of uh, optimizing the candidate experience throughout. So Kevin mentioned in the title of this session and what we put out there is, you know, we wanna we want to optimize and take a scientific approach to the, to the candidate experience. So it's not just, thinking of these pieces as independent parts, but how do you optimize and use data to make improvements and to actually to, you know, to make data-driven decisions on what you change and what you improve and where your candidates are flowing through the, through the entire funnel uh, all the way through onboarding and, and taking that optimization approach. That's really what we, what we want to get into and we have some more data later in the, in the program to, to get to. But that's the, the context. Before we get into the next section, I just want to take a quick audience poll here for a moment, just to kind of see how you all are thinking about candidate experience. So the question is, if you know, where do you where do you all see your your organization or your your department having the biggest need to improve in the candidate experience for your selection process? So if you're looking at where you want to help make that a better candidate experience, is in the sourcing stage, is in the career page, uh, the application or the assessment process the interview or the offer and onboarding. Um, so we'll pop, pop the question up. I think it's live on the on the page. We'll give you a few minutes. You, you should be able to see it, Lance, and everybody go ahead Perfect. and give a, vote, give a vote, please. So again, you know, where do, if you were to prioritize where you have the biggest opportunity to improve your, your candidate experience and your selection process, which of these would it be? And I know there's other parts of the process that could be improved as well, but we want to kind of focus on these. So we'll give a, a few more moments here for people to respond and then we'll get to the results. Yep. We'll go another 30 seconds. If you haven't voted, let us know where your biggest need to improve candidate experience in your selection process is based on these choices.
All right, Lance. It looks like it looks like that's about gonna be it. So let's Slow go ahead. Down. And, okay. Let's get the let go ahead and share the Oops. results for everybody. Perfect. So it looks like the sourcing is the the area. So we got about a third of, of the respondents saying the candidate sourcing is the biggest opportunity to improve, followed by the application and or assessment process with about a quarter of the, the respondents, 23%. Uh, deadlock between career page and interview process and then the offer and onboarding at the end. But still some pretty consistent endorsement across that. So thanks for the thanks for the input. Um, it's good to know it's you know across the, the life cycle there's there's kind of equal need seen across the the, the members that are that are attending here um, so with that we'll get into we'll start we'll kind of walk through some different strategies and techniques that the city and county of Denver have used or are using to drive engagement across different parts of their their, their process so Alex I'll turn it over to you the first section really want to get into some of the things that you can do to uh, impact the the sourcing and attraction phase. So getting to some of the strategy driven things that you've done there and, and sharing some of the experiences that, that have uh, you've implemented recently. Alex? Thanks, Lance. So I was uh, glad to see that a lot of you are interested in the, the um, candidate attraction phase. So if you'll jump to the next slide, Lance. So let me give you a little bit of context because like many, many places, our market um, conditions changed overnight. The city and county of Denver had experienced within the last decade, a historic amount of growth. At the beginning of this year, we had a thousand positions that we needed to fill in a job market that was really tight. So that was the world that we were in fighting for candidates as, as many of you probably have experienced. Then COVID hit and we had to shut down many, many of our businesses. And we went from historic growth to a major budget deficit. We no longer have a thousand positions to fill. We are only filling essential positions at this point, um, but that doesn't change our focus as the city. So we have for quite some time had a focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And that really feeds a lot of our candidate experience and how we market and try to attract individuals to work for the city. Um, so despite the fact that the conditions have changed, many of our strategies have not, how they're implemented has shifted but the actual strategy itself is the same. And a key piece of that is our employee engagement. So we're gonna go through some examples of how we have marketed to candidates. And a huge part of that is our own employees, really showing what they do and making them the champions of our marketing campaigns. Next slide, please. So we started this with talking about how we use science. One of the ways we've recently shifted is to really better understand our potential candidate pools because Denver's goal is to reflect the wonderful diversity of the residents that we serve. Um, so we really wanted to get a pulse on, you know, what should our candidate pools look like if that is truly our objective? And there's not been a real good gauge of that until recently. So we've really drawn on a few data sources to understand who we, we should be seeing in these pools. So we use the US Census data for Denver County. Um, this is a really good pulse of what our general population is. And if anybody's interested in this, there's also sub tables within that database where you can look at things like occupational groups and education and things like that to really understand for the particular position you're looking at and the requirements involved, what is that population? We also have gotten more intentional about how we look at our current workforce. What are those demographics? Because those are the people that we can leverage to help get the word out to their networks. And then we're also looking at educational institution graduation rates. Some of the positions that we're hiring for are highly technical. So we need to understand who are the folks that are coming out of schools with that type of degree and backing that up for five to even 10 years, depending on the level that we're hiring for, because sometimes that requires experience as well. So we take all three of these data sources and really look at them to help us set some realistic, but challenging diversity objectives that are driven by science and data. And that also feeds into the recruitment strategies that we then use to find those candidate pools. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a project manager position. So when we pulled the Denver County census data for project manager type roles, that this falls into the management occupational group. So for the County of Denver, when you look at these folks, um, generally about 85% of this pool is white, 12% is Hispanic and 3% is black. Now, caveat to any time you use census data, this is an estimate. 
Um, and this data is a little bit messy because people can choose as many uh, ethnic groups as they want to. So we use this as a baseline, as a talking point, but we never take this data and say, this is exactly what we expect. The next data source we pull is our current workforce. So we looked at our project managers across the city and we found that 79% of them are white, 13% are Hispanic, 3% are black, and 4% are, are some other race or ethnic background. So using this data, uh, we didn't actually pull educational data because this just requires a general bachelor's degree, which is captured in that management occupational group. Uh, we would pull the educational data if we needed a specific degree. So the recruitment target for this particular um, recruitment was we wanted a 25% diverse pool looking at what our, our current um, sources said. We wanted that to be about 15% Hispanic, 5% Black, and 5% other. Next slide, please. And I'll toss it back over to Lance. Yeah, so yeah, Alex, you kind of started with kind of teasing a little bit. Um, a lot of adaptations have been made, but want to share with us some of the things prior to 2020 and the first part of 2020, some of the strategic things you've been doing to look at the employee marketing and attraction strategies. Yeah, we'll absolutely. Through a couple of those. Yep. Great. So our first marketing campaign, we really went out to a lot of different segments of our populations to understand what is it that mattered to them? What are the things that, that attracted them to a job? What were their opinions about government work? Uh, you find some very interesting things when you ask people what their perceptions are of working for a city um, and what they think that work is. And so we really segmented this into three different groups. Uh, we had three markets and three research tactics that we used. So the groups that we were looking at were those that are brand new to the workforce. So those coming out of trade schools, uh, universities, even high school, that group of folks are young professionals, so people who have some experience but are not yet in those higher level positions, and then those who are established in their career, so generally having more experience, um, and so they, they tend to have a different set of objectives. Then we went to these three target markets to ask people a very specific set of questions. So we, we talked to our job seekers, what were their perceptions of us? Um, we talked to our current employees, uh, and then also those who were employed but not with us. So we could contrast the difference between our employees and people who worked for someone else. And we did this in three ways. We used opinion polls, we used focus groups, and then we used interception interviews. Next slide, please. So out of all of that information, we really came up with three different marketing campaigns that had different messaging. So what was important to people who were new to the workforce, they wanted to feel connection to the city that they lived in. And they wanted an opportunity to be part of something that they felt was bigger than themselves, really to make a difference. And so the tagline to this particular candidate pool was, you know, now's your chance to make a difference uh, and really build that connection. For our young professionals, the key messages that came out of the research there was that they wanted to make an impact on the city that they loved. So there's a very strong sense of love um, for people who live in Denver. It's actually really nice um, since I work for the city. I find this a beautiful thing, but people really love the city and they wanna be a part of it and they want to have that impact. So for this group, that marketing campaign was, you know, you love Denver, we'd love to have you come, come make that impact. And then for those folks that are established in their career, really what came out of that is they wanted to do work that matters, but they wanted to do it in a cutting edge kind of way. Um, so this tagline became, you know, do work that matters in the city that you love. So similar messaging, but the focus is a little different depending on who we're talking to. And you notice we have different um, pictures of our employees doing different types of work in each one of these campaigns. Next slide, please. Alex, really quick before oh, we move please. on, we had a question I think it was pertaining to the last thing. And I know I remember seeing this as well, the uh, interception interview. Uh. Yes, yeah, that's a, that's a term that came from my marketing team. Um, so these are where we'd have, we'd go to job fairs and we would just intercept people as they got done talking to our recruiters and just ask them the set of questions to get their immediate impressions after having an initial interaction with our folks. Great, thanks for taking that on the fly. Thanks for the question, keep them coming. We'll get, we'll get more at the end as well. So before I interrupted showing the, the first example here, Yes. We'll so this is a, a video that's available on or was available on the Denver website, just in general. And as I play this, the audio should work just because it is streaming. You'll see a little bit of a uh, uh, lag in the video, but want to convey it. So good to show here.
What does it look like to build a future for the city of Denver? Be a part of the city that you love. Explore careers at the city and county of Denver, where Denver works. So our second marketing campaign, which, which happened a few months after our first marketing campaign, really more focused on the diversity factor. So we have done some internal uh, looks for the last several years, and there's a gap in terms of our workforce in that representation for African American and the Hispanic segments, particularly in management positions. And so, and part of the problem is we don't have enough people in that pool. And so this marketing campaign was specifically targeted to those groups. And we used similar research tactics, but we also included professional and affinity groups, uh, social media channels, and again, using those focus groups to really understand the perceptions of these groups, what matters to them and then how we could best reach them to get them to apply to our positions. Next slide, please. So it's a little laggy, just a second. <laughs> That's okay. So I'll continue talking as the slide comes up. Um, so out of that, the idea was similar, but how the message is shaped is different based on what mattered to these groups who are within the Denver County area. So when we spoke to the African American community, it really was about providing a better standard of living um, for themselves, for their family. And then out of that, they could provide an opportunity to give back to their community. And out of that, they are then proving themselves in a way that's very important to them. So a lot of the messaging is shaped around that growth, the opportunity, but also being able to, to prove yourself. In the Hispanic community, the messaging that came out of those groups was um, getting those higher level jobs is about providing a better life and being happier, which then feeds into an opportunity to make a difference and then being proud of yourself and my family's proud of me too. And, and that family component was very strong within the Hispanic community. So you'll notice some of that messaging that happens too. So the next two slides, we have two short clips that you'll see are targeted at these different groups. Um, and just take note of how the messaging is similar, but also a little bit different because we're trying to tailor to what matters to these individuals to draw them into the city. My name is Richard, and I'm an operational supervisor for the city and county of Denver. What I like about managing my team is that it actually gives me an opportunity to engage them all the time. This is a dream job for me. Very inclusive here uh, with the city and county. The department has a diverse group of employees that represents the city. They give each and every person a fair opportunity, and the city cares about the citizens and to care about the employees. Explore careers at the city and county of Denver, where Denver works. Play the next video here. So it's queuing up here to load slowly. My name is Natalie Salcido, and I work as a supervisor for the City and County of Denver Department of Public Health and Environment. I really enjoy working with a diverse workforce. Every day is different in my job, which really, I think, makes it special. It's challenging. I like the challenge. If you're a proactive person, then there's a lot of opportunity to grow and to serve our community. My career has given me the opportunity to create a work-life balance, uh, and it has given me the financial stability that I need moving forward. I'm proud to work for the City and County of Denver. Explore careers at the city and county of Denver, where Denver works. Great, thank you, Van. Yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing those videos. I really love, I mean, what you highlighted, the different research techniques that went into driving the messages. And it sounds like, you know, a full on marketing effort to create the personas. I really love how that's leveraged along with the existing data sources. So talk about a scientific approach to leveraging data and using a using a, a really purpose-driven approach to identifying those strategies and, and, and the execution is great. So thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, in, in setting this up, we, we've uh, we've 
done a session like this before pre-pandemic and so now we're on a budget i'm curious to show to see what thing how things have changed uh, and share with the audience how things have changed you know post-pandemic and having different uh, budgeting restrictions as an organization i'm sure a lot of people are feeling that so you want to share a couple of the recent ways you've gone about adapting your your attraction and sourcing methods Yes, thank you. So those videos that you saw um, are beautiful, but they are not cheap. <laughs> and they were made pre-pandemic when things were good and we had the budget to do that. So we have now shifted our strategy to low cost options, because I'm sure as many of you are feeling the, the funds to be able to do these very nice, very flashy things are just not there. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, Lance, we are really leveraging social media heavily to recruit folks. Uh, it, it's a low cost option and a lot of people use social media. And we found that it's, it's become a very integral part of our strategy. But some of the keys to success is a change in approach. We've had social media um, platforms and use in Denver for a while, but they were never really that effective until recently. And some of the key changes in that is we have a dedicated person that is responsible for this social media content. Um, she's amazing. She actually has a marketing background and how she ended up in HR, I don't know, but she, she's the best thing to happen to that group <laughs> um, because she has a whole calendar of what's going to be posted on what days, on which platforms, what are the key messages. And really the, one of the things that you need to keep in mind is that content needs to be refreshed frequently to keep people's attention and to keep them engaged. So having someone that this is their focus is really critical to making it successful. There also needs to be some strategic planning around that content. What are some of your major initiatives? What are the key jobs you're trying to fill? Who are the, who are the folks that you're looking for to apply? Um, and where are they? And how do you tap into those channels? Uh, there's also a heavy collaboration with our recruiters when we're developing this content. And then you'll also see we're still leveraging using our employees. So all of our photos come from a bank that we have of our, our city employees doing their jobs. And we find that these photos are really key in drawing people's attention and driving engagement with our posts. Uh, we have some, some uh, metrics that have been shared with our, our TA team recently where they showed a post that has no picture and just talks about the job versus one that has a picture of the people doing the job. And the uptick in engagement is just phenomenal. You, you get thousands more views just based on that one picture. Next slide, please. So here's just a few more examples. So you'll see these are our employees and we try to highlight different types of jobs because um, we have such a range at the city. We have 26 different uh, business units or, or departments, however you want to put that. And we do a range of things, everything from plumbing to the parks, to the airport. Uh, we have the sheriff's department, the police department, all of those things. So we try to highlight different things. Next slide, please. Great. Yeah, thanks for, for sharing those and just quantifying everything and, and using that, that optimization of engagement rates. That's, I mean, the social media platform provides it. So it's great to see how, that, how that's uh, used in action. Um, so I want to take a, a quick moment to talk about the, the middle part of the process before we get into the, the later stages. So the, the evaluation and deciding section or in, you know, if you're using assessments or any type of interview process, keeping the candidates in the process. Going back to what I was highlighting earlier before, you know, at, at the, the beginning, some of the things that really drive that candidate engagement, having the transparency, having it be something where they can get some feedback and be uh, an actual participant in the brand experience. If you think on, on the left-hand side, we've identified some of the historical ways organizations have tried to increase the candidate experience with having a, a focus on appeasing the candidate and making things more pleasant and make sure it's branded and, and just receive, uh, in, infusing some things that make the candidate happy or making it less painful, if, if, uh, if we're being completely honest. Uh, the, the downside is that those are static processes. Um, you know, the, every candidate's going to get the exact same message and it's can seem it can seem generic and it seems overly deliberate um, it, it's it's not necessarily something that's going to feel very customized um, what the candidates really want in that differentiated candidate experience is something that's going to provide value to them at the right point in time so having the first and foremost just a transparent process but having experiences that are uh, delivered to do more than satisfy to give the candidate information about you know taking those brand ambassador videos that you have from, from the city and county of Denver, those are things that you can't assume that all the candidates are gonna see those in advance or they're gonna find those on your career page. So those types of uh, messages from existing employees can provide value to the candidate early in the 
process so they can make a, a more informed decision that makes it more interactive and then add features and technology in the process whether it's your assessment your assessment or your interview process that that help accelerate the decision making process giving candidates information so they feel more informed about you know when they can expect different aspects of the the, the hiring process and have everything be geared towards automating and, and making that a more frictionless process so candidates feel in, in more control so those are some of the things you can do in the middle of the, the process um, i think following those those middle stages you've got a lot of things that can still happen uh, and, and getting candidates from this, I'll call it the, the maybe the, 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 the dating phase of the process, learning about the decision they're gonna make to the commitment phase and, and engaging and onboarding all the way to onboarding the candidates. I think this is often neglected in some of the things that I've, that I've seen that Alex and, and crew are doing at city and county of Denver are really worth sharing. So Alex, I'll turn it over to you to talk about some of the things you're doing to start the pre-boarding and onboarding process. Thanks, Lance. Uh, next slide, please. So onboarding is something that years ago was handled agency by agency, manager by manager. And we heard a lot of horror stories about people showing up to the first day of work and not knowing where to go, who to talk to, not having a computer for a week or two. And, and really that leaves a very bad impression to that brand new employee and can ultimately impact their willingness to stay past the first six months or a year. Um, so we centralized this function several years ago and really streamlined the process and focused on keeping that person engaged from the point of offer all the way up through their first few weeks on the job. Um, and we found that our retention has actually gone up quite a bit since that was implemented. So some of the things that we recommend, and we actually give this to our hiring manager, I'll show you a checklist here in a little bit, but having the new employee get a welcome call from the manager after they've accepted the offer. Um, so just saying, hey, you know, hey, we're excited to have you. Do you have any other questions? Just that initial touch base. Uh, we also recommend that the new team members connect with the person on LinkedIn so they can kind of start to get a feel for who's going to be on their team. You can also use emails and tell them about exciting things that are going on in the organization. So like the city, we used to, not, not today, but uh, pre-pandemic, we used to have a lot of things going on, a lot of events and letting the, that employee know, hey, you're welcome to come to these, start getting connected with the city that you're going to be working for. And the other thing that we implemented, which is kind of fun, uh, is you can do welcome videos and send them to the uh, new employee. So we, we used to do these in meetings where we just create a short little welcome video where everybody would say hi and introduce themselves. And so the person, again, can kind of get a feel for the team before their first day. Next slide, please. In terms of the actual logistics of the process, it was also really important to standardize this so the person feels like they have everything they need to hit the ground running. Uh, so we have one point of contact that does this for the candidate and the manager. We make sure that we have consistent communication. So there's a lot of templates that we use. We also have branded materials for the new hire. So they feel like they're part of the team, part of the city. Uh, and, and we have some beautifully branded materials that our marketing uh, group came up with for us. And then also just being really transparent in communications with the hiring manager, make sure they know what they need to do, tracking where all the pieces are in the process. Uh, and so we actually developed a standard of work so that everybody knows what's expected of them and when things need to happen. So there isn't that horror story of showing up on the first day and nobody's there to meet you and there's no computer and you sit at your cubicle twiddling your thumbs. Next slide, please. So part of the streamline was creating a checklist. I don't know how many of you use checklists, but we find these extremely helpful, particularly with our hiring managers who may only do this once a year or maybe even once every five years for some of our positions. So this really clearly lays out for them, what are their specific tasks? Who are their key content, contacts? Who owns the task? Um, so that they know what they are responsible for. Um, and then if they need some help where they can find that. So this, this checklist has been really helpful with our hiring managers. Next slide. So Alex, those, I think a lot of these were from the, the pre-pandemic days. So what are some of the things you're doing differently now that it's, it's uh, I'm assuming you have at the city and county of Denver, you have employees that are onboarding completely virtual. Is that correct? Yes. So at the city, we everybody who is not required to be on site to do their job is working virtually. So since March, we have had to onboard employees in an entirely virtual world. Um, and that doesn't change the process necessarily. It requires us to be more strategic and thoughtful about how we do things. So if you'll jump to the next slide, some of the things that we have found as we've onboarded people, 
um, in this virtual world is that you need to plan more time for the logistics. So you really need to think about how are they going to get their badge? How are they going to get their laptop? Do they need someone from your IT group to set up a time to meet with them to pick these things up, show them how to log in? All of those pieces aren't as streamlined or as fast as they used to be. So you need to plan for that to make sure they're all still done before that person starts. Um, this is where we really highly recommend that you have one person that manages this entire process because when there's handoffs, things tend to slip through the cracks. So if this one person is tracking, do they have their computer? Did they get their badge? Do they have their login? Do we have all the meetings set up? Um, is really helpful to make sure it's a smooth process. We've also found that making sure the employee has a really good orientation to, and, and however this happens, whether it's formal, whether it's you as the manager just giving this orientation to them, people need to help in understanding their roles because it's not that they can just follow someone around now and learn how to do their job. They're in a brand new role, likely sitting in their house with their laptop and not sure what to do. So we need to be really clear and transparent with them as to what the expectations are, uh, what tasks they should be performing, give them directions and, and where to go for help because this is a new world for them too. And they don't have those other people around to ask. Um, being more intentional about communications is also really important. So checking in with the person more often than you would if they were on site, um, to making sure you set up time to see, do they need help? Do they understand what's going on? And then setting up virtual meetings with your employee and their new teammates. That very casual get to know you hallway conversation no longer exists. And I think many of us feel that. Uh, and, and we feel that as employees who are already part of the team. And so for someone who is brand new and doesn't know anyone, having those set up times to just get to know their coworkers can be really important. And, and really being mindful about how you schedule those out so people have time to do that and, and really focus on the new person. And then just some fun team building things because the, you know, let's all go out to lunch together or, you know, after work, let's go have happy hour or whatever. That doesn't exist right now. So how can we build those things in a virtual format? So again, people can get to know each other and start to build that trust that is so critical to, to teams performing at their highest levels. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing, Alex. And I think just in general, one of the things that in earlier conversations that we've had, thinking through the the cultural norms and a lot of the things that you just kind of take for granted and you know people can pick up things more quickly if they're surrounded by people or they can ask that informal question hey you know if people usually go five minutes early to meetings or you know what do people go on video for calls I mean just some of those things that you're taking for granted because we've been able to slowly adapt to these things in a virtual environment your new employee day one doesn't have that context and, and just kind of think through and I like the, the over communicate and, and just more, more check-ins, more communication. I think it's really valuable. So I, that, that candidate experience and new, new employee experience really, uh, you can't go wrong with, with more communication. Thanks, thanks for sharing, Alex. Just a reminder to the audience, I've had a few more questions have come in, a few have been answered, so please submit those. Um, we're getting closer to the end here. Um, one, I'm uh, sorry about the lag there in the clipboard. So, kind of pulling some of the things together and, and how to take action. So to improve the candidate experience throughout the entire re recruitment process. I think one thing is just starting with some, some investigation and reflection on the existing process. So as you look at your entire candidate funnel as your hiring process, was it designed for candidates? They're, they're gonna take that really linear approach, right? They're gonna stop, start with, I wanna learn about the city and county of Denver or whatever organization you're, you're working at and do the research and find the jobs. Or is it, you know, is that, is that what it's designed for? And you have candidates that are entering at, at random points in the process or later points in the process because they've just applied through one of the job boards or, or through a, a social post. So be honest with yourself and understand to the, the extent to which it's been designed in an, in an era that candidates aren't really uh, engaging with, with the recruitment process. Um, I really like the understanding of do your actual sourcing messages align with the, the target audiences and the target candidate audiences you're looking to recruit. So the strategic approach, and you know, this is another one of those things in addition to the overall process, but you know, welcome messages and all the, the messages throughout the, the application, through the in, invitations, um, even the subtlety of in adjusting the 
uh, interview invitation communications if you're doing it virtual now instead of in person. Um, all the sourcing messages aligning to your target audience and, and the, the, the messaging throughout. Um, and then you can use social media, you're going to get engagement, you're going to be able to see impressions on Twitter or, or LinkedIn. So look at the engagement and are they actually effective at driving your message and think like a marketer, you can do A-B testing. So at, to Alex's example, they looked at the, the engagement rate for uh, posts with, with pictures and posts without pictures and saw the increase in engagement with pictures. So, you know, crowdsource the pictures. If you don't have them, get people to, to take those and, and, and pull those in, but, but use the data that's at your fingertips, just simple data about impressions and, and views in, in the social media channels where you're uh, posting your, your jobs. And then taking that a little bit further, collecting metrics. Is there an opportunity to collect candidate feedback? And you ask new employees about their perceptions of the process, what would they improve and find those, find every opportunity to make even the little things better, use a data driven, -driven approach and a scientific approach to, to all those improvements. Um, thinking, ask yourself how, how clearly is the entire process out, outlined and when are they learning about the process? Um, conveying fair, Fairness throughout, and that's again one of the things that's going to overall drive the perception of the process. Is it feel fair, and, and are the, the actions and activities you're doing in that process perceived as fair by your candidates? Um, think, look for opportunities for feedback. Uh, avoid that that black hole or the the, the uh, you know the ghosting <laughs> that it can feel like for a candidate if you if if they've you know submitted information from to you uh, and you haven't heard from them or they haven't heard from you, they're gonna feel ghosted and, and don't, uh, obviously on the other side, don't leave candidates in, in a place where you're, you're ghosting them. Um, and then final you know, final thing is to leverage data collected that's in the hiring process uh, beyond the selection process. So you're learning a lot about the candidate. We didn't talk much about this, but one of the things that I think is really important, especially if you're using an assessment, to use that for, for how you tailor the onboarding process. If you have an assessment in the process, you can use a developmental report or output to help coach and understand where that person may need some focused developmental guidance during their during their onboarding. So some tips that we'll, we'll send out with the, the presentation to so that you have these as references. Um, and with that, please submit your questions. We've got, a, I think we've got a few coming in here. Kevin, I'll let you facilitate the, the Q&A, but please submit your questions and we'll, we'll open it up for, for for Q&A now. Absolutely. Thank you both, uh, Lance and Alex. That, that was, um, as I like to say, chock full of vitamins and minerals in that in that presentation. Um, lots of really great information. I, Alex, I want to go back. The first question I'd like to ask, actually, going back to the the, the marketing portion of, of the presentation, and you've done some pretty amazing work uh, for the city of Denver in that regard. And, and, and budget aside, which makes sense, right? Pre-COVID was a different world than, than during what about time investment right because maybe I'm a, I'm a smaller recruiting team or or we're we just we're over oh, we're a leaner team now unfortunately because of covid that was a lot of work to um, I'm sure to like do the research and um, write up the personas and do the targeting so what 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 did that look like in time wise so this and and I, I speak as a representative of our marketing team because I was actually not involved in the initial marketing campaign, but this was months of their time and full transparency, we had a firm that helped us with this as well. So if you're looking as a leaner team, you're going to need to be much more targeted and really, so I, I, honestly, I would recommend taking a step back and looking at your organization, your different positions and looking at where do you need the most help? Um, what positions really need that, that marketing the most and focus right. your efforts? Because trying to do a large campaign is very expensive. It is very time consuming. But if you can focus on say one position. So recently we focused quite heavily on civil engineers and that's been post, you know, post COVID coming. And so that, that marketing campaign is not as intensive, but it's extremely targeted. So we're still getting some traction without putting in hundreds of hours and lots and lots of money. Well, and that's, and I think what's important to note there too is the is the the, the partnership with the marketing team as well. Absolutely. And, and I think that's one thing that a lot of organizations um, uh, we've been hearing, at least in our candy community, that that they're they're succeeding when they when they can develop that partnership and have have the the marketing help champion their work on recruitment marketing and a related question from one of the attendees today 
regarding the social media campaigns, were there were there any specific vendors that that the city of Denver worked with, or was it just the internal employee that you had mentioned that was did a lot of that focused work? Uh, if there wasn't a vendor, how did the employee come up with the post to make sure to target all of your candidate types? That's again a lot of work. Yeah. So this was all internal, as I mentioned. We are actually really blessed. We have someone with a marketing background who works in our talent acquisition organization. And so she does a lot of research in terms of with, with the recruiter to say, who do we need to target for this position? What are the groups we're trying to look for? What are the platforms that these folks tend to uh, go to? And some of that is just industry research. Um, so she'll do that. And then she also tracks all the data in terms of what types of posts are getting the most engagement or getting the most likes or people are commenting about and we use that to inform our efforts going forward but yeah we are actually really lucky this is all internal yeah no that's it's really important too it, especially if you could identify somebody who who has those skills and uh that could really help you get something off the ground at your at your organization and um and definitely partner and, and make them a champion as well here's another question about do you have any follow-up feedback uh, on the feedback campaign after the employee is onboarded? So um, I think in other, in other words, are you asking for feedback after they're onboarded about their experience? And did that meet the company's expectations? Did it meet the candidate expectations? If not, what was some of the, what were some of the area, the gaps that you found if, if you did survey the candidates? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have a feedback survey that goes to the hiring manager, uh, generally okay. three to four weeks after the hire is complete. We actually had plans to do a candidate survey um, the middle of this year that was supposed to launch. Uh, that that kind of went out the window uh, with working for a city, much of our efforts recently have been on redistributing workforce to support uh, COVID-19 efforts. Yeah, sure. So that is the intention because we do want to hear from the candidate. Was it, you know, was the experience what you expected? Were there, were there problems? We do get anecdotal feedback, but we would like to structure that much more. So again, we can use data and science to inform our efforts going forward. Yeah, I, well, I would love with would love that as well to see that happen and come to fruition for you, since that's what our research organization focuses on. And I think it's, I think another thing that we find is that when companies and organizations do ask for feedback, and then do something with that feedback as well, right? The whole point is right. is to find out what are strengths and weaknesses, and let's make some improvements. And that can though pay off in positive candidate sentiment and their willingness to do stuff again, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's apply for jobs or just just be a brand champion, right, of the the city of Denver for that matter. Um, here's another question: What was the science behind developing the twenty five percent? diversity targets. Yeah, so in that example, what we looked at, so when we looked at the, the census data for our area, 85% of that, that pool is white, and then you have about 13% Hispanic and 3%, 3 to 4% Black. Um, so we knew that in the general population, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to say, we want a 50% diverse candidate pool. And to be transparent, we have a lot of hiring managers that have a lot of passion around this, and that is wonderful. But they then expect our recruiters to be able to find them a 50% diverse pool when there are requirements that tend to limit that diversity for a variety of reasons that are much bigger than the talent acquisition organization at the city. So what we're using the information from the census is to try and benchmark what are our basic expectations then we take and look at our employee population because we have found that our employee population is incredibly useful uh, to gather people that we normally can't reach because they can reach out to their own personal networks. And so if we see that we have a higher percentage of uh, diverse folks already in the job, we would then expect we could get more diverse applicants than would be expected in the population. So that's kind of how we got to, in that example, the 25%, because based on our employee population, 21% of them were diverse. And yeah. we, we want to do a little bit better than that. Sure. So that's how we got to the 25. Again, these are targets. Um, actually, I think in that recruitment, we actually hit 30%, if I remember right. Um, but that, that's kind of how we set the targets. Oh, that's great to hear then. Absolutely. I, I, I want to ask a question about uh, at the towards the end when you started talking about onboarding it it's it, it's fascinating because the past 
few years in our talent board candy research employers when they self-assess how they're how they're doing in recruiting and where they think that they need work onboarding has has always been there um and as something that that they feel like they need work and, and to improve upon i mean this is you know these are the people that you want to hire and grow and sustain the business um what, and this year is no exception, right? Especially having to go virtual and, and virtualize. So you you had a pretty amazing checklist and a lot of things that, and we know in our data too, that the more stuff that happens before I start, the more engagement I get, the more I can start meeting team members and understanding what the, the, the scope of work's going to be before day one, it really can be a, a retention starter out of the gate. What What is just, you know, a couple of things that like, if I'm, if we're struggling right now, my organization with onboarding, especially in, in the virtual environment, what, what are two things I should do out of all that stuff? First, centralize it and, and make one or two people in charge of the process, because that will help make sure that things get done um, and things don't fall through the cracks. That's the biggest thing. And then the second thing is write down your process and make sure that it's followed. That statement of work that we have used for a few years now has been a lifesaver, particularly if you if you end up changing out people that are responsible for this, that statement of work is your guide on how to do this effectively. Well, excellent, the great answer. And I thank you so much, Alex, again, and Lance as well in SHL. And the best of luck to, to, to the city of Denver um, on, on the, the future endeavors and, and initiatives that you focus on. Um, I think that is it. There's no more questions and we are now running towards the end. So um, again, thank you all very much for attending. And we hope that um, we will be again recording this if we didn't say that earlier and be sharing that again with you all. So thanks everybody. Have a great rest of the week and weekend. And again, thanks Lance and Alex. Thank you all. Thanks for attending. Thanks Kevin. Thanks Alex. Thanks everybody. <laughs>